during diet reconstruction using stable isotope analysis to prevent variation in lipid content from confounding variation in diet, lipids must be extracted. Lipid extraction enriches both carbon and nitrogen signatures as shown here. If appropriate techniques are used, then lipid extraction will provide a simpler, homogeneous matrix simplifying diet reconstruction from stable isotope analysis. Lipid extraction with a nonpolar solvent will remove nonpolar lipids, such as the triglycerides stored in this adipocyte. Lipid extraction with a polar solvent will remove both nonpolar and polar lipids, including the structural phospholipids in the cell and organelle membranes. I'm Jim Roth from the, from the University of Manitoba. And today we'll show you a series of detailed techniques for preparing samples that can be used in the growing number of studies that use stable isotope analysis for reconstructing the diets of animals. These techniques have been developed in many different laboratories, and today we'll show you what we consider to be best practices. I am Kyle Elliott from McGill University. Various lipid extraction techniques are available in the literature. The two techniques that we will present today will be useful for anyone needing to use lipid extraction in ecology. I'm Kevin Crook, a research associate at the University of Manitoba. Lipids are depleted in 13C compared with protein, and variation in lipid content can confound interpretation of diet from stable isotope analysis. It is therefore necessary to remove lipids prior to performing stable isotope analysis. The methods described here can help scientists maintain consistency in preparation to ensure reported values reflect differences in diet and not lipid content. Subsampling tissue. The protocol described here is specifically for muscle but can be used with little alteration for any other soft tissue, such as egg contents, plasma, or other internal organs. Preparing samples for stable isotope analysis requires certain steps to be followed to ensure that accurate results are obtained to prevent cross-contamination. To prevent contamination, clean gloves should be worn at all times, both to protect the sample and yourself. We use a 70% ethanol solution to clean and disinfect our tools to counter other surfaces. Muscle samples usually start as pieces of frozen meat that must be removed from the freezer. As initial samples are usually far more than is needed, the samples are cut into small, approximately grape-sized pieces with either a scalpel or a knife. Try to include only lean, red muscle with as little fat and connective tissue as possible. This may be difficult depending on the quality of sample you have to work with. Patience and attention to detail is required. The sample run for stabilized toe analysis should consist of a microcentrifuge tube filled about halfway with muscle. The tube should be labeled with a fine tube point marker on the lid and side with the sample ID number. Use tweezers to pack the sample into the tube. When packing the tube, avoid leaving air pockets underneath the sample as they may expand and force the sample out of the tube during freeze drying. Freeze drying. Prior to stabilized stop analysis, samples must be dried to remove all traces of water from the sample and prevent decomposition during storage. Freeze drying is a preferred method for muscle samples or other soft tissues, but hair, feathers, or plant samples can be dried in a drying oven. Samples should be frozen before using the freeze dryer as any liquid material may foam and expand, causing cross-contamination with neighboring samples. Ensure that all tube lids are open so the vacuum reaches the sample. Grease the seals with silicon to create a strong seal. Ensure that the air valve is closed and that the plastic end cap is inserted into the end of the rubber drain hose attached to the bottom of the dryer. Samples typically need at least 48 hours of freeze drying to completely remove moisture and will not be affected by freeze drying for longer than is necessary. To end the freeze drying, very slowly open the valve on the top to allow air into the dome. It will be possible to hear the air rushing in. Once the air can no longer be heard, take the samples out. The samples are now completely dehydrated and no longer need to be kept frozen and can be stored in a desiccator cabinet. Take the end cap out of the drain hose to allow the liquid to drain. Once the frost in the freezer coils has melted, use paper towels to dry the inside of the freeze dryer. Leave the dome off so moisture from the freezer coils does not condense on the inside. 
To prevent rehydration, it is best to store the samples in a desiccator cabinet. Lipid extraction on Soxless apparatus. Crushing the dried sample with mortar and pestle for a few seconds will break up connective tissue and muscle, making the sample easier to wrap in a filter paper and allowing the solvent to penetrate more easily. Crushing the sample with a pestle for a few seconds, and ideally the sample will break into small pieces. To prevent bits of cellulose shed from the thimbles from contaminating the samples, each sample will be wrapped in glass microfiber filter paper. Dump the sample out of the mortar into the filter paper. Then, carefully wrap the sample in the filter paper by folding over each end and rolling it up like a burrito. There may be more sample than can fit in a single filter paper without ripping it, but one paper will hold plenty for stable isotope analysis. Before inserting the sample, check the thimble for large pieces of paper or sample that may be stuck to the bottom, remove any such pieces and throw them in the garbage, then slide the rolled paper into the thimble. Once all samples have been prepared, or all 36 th thimbles are full, for a 6 heater unit, begin loading them into the socklet. First unscrew the clamp at the top and carefully slide the condenser, the top section up and out of the extractor. Then retighten the clamp to hold the condenser in place. Slide the extractor out of the flask. You may need to top up or replace the solvent. Different solvents can be used, uh, either polar or non-polar solvents, depending on whether or not uh, non-polar or polar lipids are being extracted. Use long forceps to slide the six thimbles from one beaker into the extractor, all the way to the bottom. If they are stacked on top of each other, they will not become fully immersed in the solvent and the soxlet will not be effective. Make sure the thimbles are not blocking the siphon as this will not allow the solvent to drain back into the flask. The extractor is then reinserted into the solvent flask and both are placed back into the soxlet. For demonstration purposes, we have taken this video with the fume hood sash up. In reality, all procedures with solvents or the socklet should occur under an operating fume hood with the sash down. Once reinserted, the socklet is turned on. Eventually, the socklet will start boiling. Once solvent levels reach the siphon, the samples will drain. Repeated immersion in a solvent followed by draining is what efficiently extracts the samples. Samples need at least 8 hours in the socklet. It can be left overnight, but not longer than 24 hours as solvent may boil dry. After running, turn off the socklet heaters and remove the samples, placing them back into their appropriate beakers with the long forceps. The flask on the right has fresh solvent, while the flask on the left has solvent after 8 hours of extraction. Place the beakers with the samples into the drying oven set at 60 degrees Celsius for at least 48 hours. Manual Lipid Extraction If a soxlet apparatus is not available, it is necessary to manually perform the lipid extraction. Add the solvent to a centrifuge tube with a sample from step 1. Typically this is chloroform methanol which is known as Fulks reagent. The final volume of the solvent should be 20 times the tissue sample. The whole mixture is then agitated for 15 to 20 minutes on a shaker at room temperature. The sample is, is then removed from the shaker and centrifuged to create a pellet at the bottom from which the solvent can easily be removed.
The solvent is then removed and the extraction step repeated. This should be repeated three times for a thorough wash. Finally, evaporate the samples under vacuum in a rotary evaporator or under nitrogen steam if the volume is low. Unpacking and homogenization. Once the samples have dried, they must be removed from the thimbles and prepared for weighing. Before a sample can be weighed, it must be reduced to a fine powder. Label the vial with the sample ID number on the lid and also on the sides of the vial written twice 90 degrees apart. Carefully remove the sample from the thimble. Be gentle as the filter paper will be very delicate and can rip easily. Check the thimble to make sure no sample or large chunks of filter paper remain in the bottom. Then, unwrap the filter paper, empty the sample in the vial and discard the filter paper. Any large samples that require more than one thimble can be combined into one vial. If small pieces of filter paper become stuck to the sample, try to remove these with forceps. Then, use the blunt handle end of the probe to crush the sample inside the vial. Be careful not to use too much force as the glass vials are prone to breaking. Pounding or grinding the sample should reduce some of the sample into fine powder, which is what is weighed out and prepared for final analysis. Weighing. A precise amount of sample must be weighed out on the microbalance and carefully packaged in tin capsules for mass spec analysis. The final step of sample preparation demands a great deal of precision. Any mistake at this stage is almost guaranteed to affect the accuracy of the final results. Proper sterilization, cleanliness of workspace and materials are particularly important to avoid contamination. The microbalance is a delicate and expensive instrument. It must be handled carefully, even a vibration in the table may affect the reading. After zeroing the tin capsules, very carefully use the forceps to take some of the powdery sample out of the vial and place it in the capsule. Very little is needed. Consult the lab where the stabilized stop ratios will be measured to determine how much. Only add the fine powder, not chunks of sample, as these chunks may not be pure tissue. When enough sample is on the forceps, open the balance door and place the capsule in the center of the tray like before. Be careful not to spill it. If sample is stuck to the forceps or the outside of the capsule, it should be gently wiped off with a Kim wipe before entering the balance. Different tissues will have different weight windows. If the weight is below this window, the sample may not be detectable by the mass spec, and if it is higher, it may go off the calibrated scale. If the weight is not correct, then add or remove sample. Be very careful when removing the sample, as the point of the forceps can easily tear the bottom of the capsule. If this happens, throw the capsule away and restart. Once the correct weight is obtained, roll or squeeze the capsule into a tight ball or cube using two pairs of forceps or glove fingers. It is sometimes easiest to crimp the end closed with forceps before rolling to prevent sample coming out while rolling. The ball or cube should be as small as possible with no cracks, protrusions, or angular edges as these may become caught in the mass specs auto sampler. Here is another perspective of how to crimp or form the ball. Finally, weigh the final sample and place it in an A612 plate for shipping to the mass spec laboratory. Here are some typical results sent back by the stable isotope lab. Two columns show the delta values for nitrogen and carbon. Another two columns show the nitrogen and carbon weights. The ratio of carbon to nitrogen provides an index of the amount of lipids in tissue, as most lipids have no nitrogen. For polar extraction, this should typically below, be below 4. For nonpolar extraction, it should be below 4.5. Here we show the effect of lipid extraction. The non-extracted C-to-N ratio on the x-axis and the effect of lipid extraction on the carbon delta values on the y-axis. The polar solvent, chloroform ethanol, extracted polar as well as nonpolar lipids and therefore altered the carbon signature to a greater degree. The carbon signature was also altered more for those tissues with a higher original C to N ratio. 
So our objective here has been to illustrate all the sample preparation techniques that we use in our lab for preparing samples for stabilized isotope analysis. In particular, the lipid extraction, because lipids can have such a large effect on isotopic signatures. Our application is to use these samples to understand something about the diets of animals, but there are many other applications that these techniques are used for. Our hope is that by illustrating what we consider to be best practices, we may provide some consistency in some of these methods.